So thank you all for joining us this morning um, and thank you all for logging in so promptly. Uh, we might have um, a few other um, students logging in over um, the next few minutes. Um, normally uh, we start these sessions about five past um, the hour. Uh, so I'll just take you through uh, a few housekeeping rules. Um, if for any reason you can't hear the audio or can't see the video or it seems to be coming in and out, um, what I would suggest to do um, if it doesn't sound too much like an IT person is to um, log out of the session and then log back in. Uh, you will be able to join the session at any time um, so you won't have any problems getting back in and I'll be here throughout the session um, to admit you into the room if you have to leave for any reason. Um, also just to let you know that we do record these sessions um, just so students who weren't able to attend uh, today can watch this back and also if you would like to watch this back that you are able to do so as well. Um, so that's just to let you know that it is being recorded. Um, and then just let you know, I mean, a number of you are probably familiar with Zoom um, at this point. I think everybody's used Zoom a number of times, but if you aren't used to this platform, if you just hover your mouse across the bottom of the platform, you will see that you have um, a chat box. And so do feel free to pop into the chat box um, your name, where you're listening in from today um, and what brought you to this session. Um, and then throughout the session today, if you have any particular questions or opinions or ideas that you'd like to share, do feel free to pop that into the chat box. And we will be kind of looking at that as we go through the session um, and looking to answer any queries you have. Uh, once we've reached the end of the presentation part of the session, um, if you do have further questions, we do also um, like to invite you to ask those um, through the audio. And so again, if you scroll to the bottom of your screen, you'll see that you have the raise a hand function there. Um, so towards the end of the presentation, if you want to raise any questions, do feel free to pop your um, raise a hand on um, and then we'll be able to invite you to unmute and then ask a question. Uh, you can also have your videos on if you would like to or you can keep them off if you prefer. Um, I always think it's nice when we get into the discussion point uh, to have your videos on. Um, I think it's just nice to see everybody, but again, it's a personal preference for yourself. Um, and then lastly, um, just to say that uh, we will be sending round the recordings of these after the session. Um, so again, if you uh, want to watch them back, you have plenty of time to do so. And what I'll do is I will just pop my details into um, the chat now um, so that you have them should anything happen and you're not able to get back into the session um, or you just wanna have some follow-up questions um, after the session. Um, I will be able to answer any follow-up questions you have um, on general kind of student experience, anything to do with the admissions um, process, so um, getting your place with us and any of the administrative parts. Um, so do feel free to pop anything through to me um, on the email that I've just put into the chat. And so now I'll hand over to the lovely Sean. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for coming this morning. My name is Sean Hawthorne. And I am um, the convener, which means I'm the administrator of the BA World Philosophies at SAAS. What I'm going to do this morning is just kind of introduce you to the approach that we take to philosophy at SAAS, give you a sense of the structure of the program, the other elements of the support system that you have at SAAS, and then we'll have, as Kimberly says, plenty of time for um, questions. And you're always welcome to follow up with me um, after this session, even if you would just like to have a one-to-one -one chat with me, I'm really happy to arrange that with you. So welcome to the presentation of the overview of world's philosophies. Now, Philosophies at SOAS is very, well, not very different, but it takes a quite different approach to other philosophy programs that you might find throughout the um, rest of the country. And the reason for that is that our institution focuses on um, the cultures, the societies, the politics, uh, the histories, and so on, of the regions of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Now, when you study philosophy at university, you rarely encounter the fact that most cultures throughout history have actually engaged in the kinds of questions that philosophy does. What you find in most philosophy programs is an emphasis on largely um, uh, Anglo-American philosophy or European philosophy. But we want to introduce our students to the idea that other 
uh, cultures have very rich intellectual traditions um, that have in many ways actually influenced a lot of developments in European uh, philosophy. So we want to make sure that you recognize that philosophy is in fact a global discipline, full of interesting cross-cultural dialogues uh, that have informed the ways in which philosophers have answered uh, some of the big questions. What is the meaning of life? What is the nature of truth? How can I really know that what I know is true? And so on. So our intention in this program is to ensure that our um, treatments of philosophy reflects the intellectual traditions of the world, not just Europe, not just the Anglophone world. That said, it's not as though we neglect European or Anglophone philosophy. We emphasize the dialogue that is um, possible when you put these traditions alongside each other, whether we're talking about Chinese philosophy, Islamic philosophy, um, uh, Enlightenment philosophy. So here we, we would be thinking about thinkers such as David Hume or Immanuel Kant. These philosophical traditions are able to have very interesting conversations between each other, such that we're able to reflect more deeply on some of those big questions. We also think it's really important that you understand philosophical traditions in their own terms. They're not all the same. They're not all asking the same questions. They're trying to respond to issues in their own societies, um, whether that's historically or in the contemporary era, uh, in ways that speak to the people of their societies. And so we try to make sure that you have plenty of exposure to the specificity, the specifics of individual intellectual traditions, Indian philosophy, Chinese thought, Islamic philosophy, African philosophy, and so on. But we also want to make sure that uh, you experience a philosophy degree. So we make sure that you are trained in the main branches of philosophy, the sub branches that, as they're often known, whether that's logic, ethics, metaphysics, epistemology, which is the study of how we know what we know, hermeneutics, which are theories of interpretation, how when we read something, we know that we are at least approximating what the original author uh, wanted to uh, convey, and ontology, which is the study of what it is to exist, to be, what's the meaning of life, those really big um, questions. And then finally, I think another element that makes our philosophy program quite unique is that we pay very close attention to some very uh, contemporary debates around uh, decolonization, meaning how do we ensure that what we're studying doesn't repeat some of the mistakes and the problems of the past that were involved in the European colonization of most of the world, where European ideas were introduced to other societies and were used to kind of structure them, but also to create a sense of European superiority and the inferiority of other cultures. And we really want to challenge that. We also pay close attention to questions of race, gender, disability, sexuality, in the ways in which ideas always come from who you are, not simply what you are. So I would say that in a nutshell, that is the kind of approach that we take to philosophy at SAS. And these are the things I think that mark our program out as really quite different from most of the philosophy programs in the rest of the UK, if in, in fact, not in the rest of the, the world, it really is quite a unique program. Now, I just want to introduce you to the main teaching team. The, these three people, myself included, are the people who um, teach the core elements of the program. Uh, Dr. Andrew Hines, he is a specialist in um, European thought, continental philosophy from Europe, but is very interested and does a lot of work on how to put those that European thought in conversation with particularly Islamic and African philosophy as well as Indian thought. And he also does some work on Chinese thought. Uh, Dr. Elvis Imafidon is a specialist in African philosophy, um, but he's also a, a great expert in theories of interpretation 
and um, and ethics. And then finally myself, I'm the, the convener of the program and I teach largely on questions of race, decolonization um, and uh, issues of um, perspectives coming from disability, sexuality, gender um, and so on. Of course, there are many other people teaching on this uh, program, but we're the ones that teach uh, the core curriculum. That's where you get a real grip on the, the subfields of uh, philosophy, logic, ethics, philosophies of language, and so on and so forth. But you'll encounter plenty of others who are specialists in individual intellectual traditions. So on that note, um, just to tell you what the structure of the program looks like, what we have is that over the course of the three years that you study with us, if you're doing a single honours degree, meaning you're just doing world philosophies, your choice expands over time. And what we try to ensure is that you're able to build a specialism in an intellectual tradition, whilst nonetheless getting the kind of core issues in philosophy under your belt. So in year one, you don't really have any choice at all. And that's because we need to make sure that you've got the foundations to make sure that in the second and third year, uh, you're able to build on those. So you do a course on world philosophies and context that's surveying kind of history of philosophy across the world, looking at major themes in different intellectual traditions. You do a course called reading and writing philosophy, um, which is really training you to read philosophical texts, but also uh, increasingly to be able to produce them yourself, to create robust arguments. There's also a course called Methods, Themes and Debates in World Philosophies, and that's looking at the difference of world philosophies to uh, perhaps a more conventional understanding of what philosophy is and what you need to be able to um, engage successfully with the questions that arise when you start to expand what philosophy means. You do a course called Philosophy, Race and Racism. That's a course that I teach. And that is a course that looks at the history of racism within the discipline of philosophy, and then looks at the kind of ways in which um, philosophers of color, black philosophers, indigenous philosophers, uh, start to both criticize the discipline of philosophy, but produce their own uh, philosophies. And in the second term, you are introduced to the subfields of philosophy, ethics, metaphysics, um, epistemology, and logic as well. And those are all courses that approach the, the subfields, drawing on resources from many of the world's different intellectual traditions. In the second year, you then begin to engage with the questions of cross-cultural interpretation that provide a really good foundation for your, uh, for your encounter with the intellectual traditions of the world. So you do a full year module called Philosophies of Interpretation and Understanding, looking at how um, perhaps understanding sometimes fails across different cultural milieus, what kind of common language we might need to understand things that are different from perhaps those which we have encountered before um, and some of the questions of power that often accompany the possibility of interpretation the use of language and so on and then you're able to do um, to select modules in what we call the traditions of philosophy whether that's indian um, philosophy or indian buddhist philosophy classical Chinese thought, African philosophy, Islam, uh, Islamic thought and its relationship to rationality, Jewish thought, um, and Zoroastrianism, which was a very influential um, uh, intellectual tradition on uh, the, um, the kind of philosophical dimensions of both Judaism, uh, of, sorry, of all Judaism, Christianity, um, and Islam. So it's a very good kind of um, grounding to understand how preoccupations with, for example, the nature of evil develop, um, as well as um, perhaps more abstract ideas such as um, why we see the world in terms of um, this and not that, um, and so on. So these modules all provide a really good kind of introduction 
two modules that are then available in the second year where you move to a much more advanced level. We do a module called the Margins of Philosophy, which is another course that I teach, and that is really preoccupied um, with those bodies of thought that philosophy has traditionally excluded, such as perspectives from uh, disabled thinkers, queer thinkers, um, post-colonial black thinkers, feminist thinkers, and, and so on, as a means of making philosophy much more hospitable to um, groups or communities that have not been considered to have anything to offer to philosophy. And we show that actually they have a great deal to offer. You can also do an independent study project, which is a, uh, a 10,000 word essay where you are supervised by uh, a member of staff who's a specialist in what you want to work on. And this is really an opportunity for you to get much more involved in uh, researching something that really interests you over the course of your uh, degree. And then again, we have these kind of traditions of philosophy modules that you're able to do uh, that build on the modules that you've done um, in the previous year. And again, you know, if you want to specialize in Chinese thought or Islamic thought, Jewish thought, Indian thought, and so on, uh, you're able to kind of build up that specialism through the modules that are available. Now, if you're interested in doing a joint honours degree, and there are many um, combinations that you can do, and you can just go to the website to have a look at that, what co combinations of degrees you can do. Um, you can only do, um, well, you have to do fewer um, options, but nonetheless, you still fulfil um, the, the core components that the single honours um, students do. You just um, have to um, choose which ones you want to do in any given um, year. But all of the modules that are available to the um, single honours students are also available to you if you're doing um, joint honours. You just don't have as much choice because um, you have to also do a, a similar number of credits in your other subject. I should also add that for um, single honour students in any given year, you're able to exchange 30 credits, whether that's a fifth, two 15 credit modules or a 30 credit module uh, for either a language or for a module that is available in another department. So that perhaps you're interested in political thought and so you want to do a module in uh, the politics department, that's completely open to you. That's not possible in the joint honours program uh, because you have to fulfill the right number of credits in each of your subject areas and you've got enough on your hands uh, to do that. Now that gives you a sense of the structure of the program um, but it's probably useful to know uh, the kind of support that will be available to you as you uh, go through the program. Um, every student on the program is assigned an academic advisor who you meet with um, at least once a term, usually often uh, a bit more often than that, just to check your progress, make sure that you're happy, make sure that you're performing to the best of your ability, and also looking to the future, the kinds of careers or um, things that you might want to do next and really supporting you kind of reaching your goals. You have access to the program convener. Sorry, I just spotted a spelling error there. Uh, that's me. You can come to me at any time and talk to me um, about any issues that you're having, but also you can talk to me um, about your module choices, kinds of things that you're interested um, in. And I'm also there to provide pastoral support as well. If you're really having a rough time, then I'm very happy just to sit with you and to talk to you, talk you through what's what's happening, as well as finding ways in which we can support you. Uh, every year of the programme also has student representatives, and these are there to bring to my attention, but also to the core teaching team, any kind of broader problems or issues or things that perhaps you are unhappy with in the programme so that we can fix those quickly. And this is a nice and anonymous way of making sure that we're aware of any struggles that are going on. You have um, weekly contact with your lecturers. Um, certainly in the first year, you will have an average 
of between three to four hours contact time with your lecturers that will be in the classroom in seminars but also in office hours and that's office hours where you could just pop in to your teacher's office and talk to them about particular questions that you have about the course you're doing with them advice about writing some of the coursework or exams that kind of thing and then outside of the department we also have a number of support services there's the student well-being and advice department that offers a whole range of services whether that's to do with mental health um, support for various types of disability, financial advice, career um, advice, although careers, the career service is also somewhat independent of them. Um, uh, advice on housing and so on. And they, they're a really good kind of first port uh, to go to if there's any aspect of, of studying and living um, in SAAS that you need extra support with. There's also an excellent learning and teaching support department that offers individual um, sessions. So you can go to them with your coursework when you've had it returned, if you're not happy with your grade and get some training about how to improve it. But they also offer a bunch of different courses and workshops on a number of um, study skills like, you know, knowing how to read, knowing how to structure essay, that kind of thing. And then finally, our career service is really um, extraordinarily good and has many um, excellent connections to various industries that our SAAS uh, students are very well placed in. But they also um, offer clinics on, on shaping your uh, CV, enabling you to get volunteering and internship experience and all of that kind of stuff. So if you come to us, um, I always encourage our first year students to uh, make a point of visiting them right from the get go so that you've got a really good sense of where you want to get to by the end of the degree. Now, at the same time, whilst the uh, degree at SAAS is, is quite unique, SAAS itself is a unique um, and I have to say fantastic institution. I am myself and an alumnus of uh, SAAS. I did both my uh, undergraduate degree at SAAS and my PhD at SAAS. Um, it's a very special institution. It's a kind of hidden jewel. It has an outstanding research culture, meaning that every member of staff at SAAS is involved in producing books, journal articles, and so on that are at the cutting edge of the field. We're actively thinking and writing all the time about the kinds of things you're going to encounter in the classroom. And our department is second in the UK for research that is recognized as internationally excellent, meaning it's, it's right up there. Uh, in terms of philosophy departments in the UK, we are in the top 20 philosophy departments, likely in fact, in the next round of league tables to go up. Our, um, and sorry, this is slightly out of date, our NSS um, score was actually 99%, I think this year, meaning the National Student Survey for Satisfaction with the degree as a whole. That was our third year students saying that they, they super enjoyed the degree and highly recommend it. Our teaching um, is um, silver um, in the teaching excellence framework which means that um, we produce excellent outcomes for our students. And we have a very high employability rate for our graduates. So 97% of graduates are in employment or they go on to do master's degree within six months of finishing their degree. So us um, students are highly employable, highly sought out by um, employers of various dimensions. And here's a, um, a very kind of general list of the kinds of areas that our students go on to after they finish their degrees um, with us. And so, as you can see, a philosophy degree from SAAS prepares you really to enter any industry that you might be interested in or to go on to further uh, study, which I would say probably about a third to a, um, a quarter of our students go on to do. Um, in terms of our entrance requirements, uh, we accept 
um, students with A-level results, either AAB or ABB. Generally, um, we tend to, to look more carefully at those with predicted at least grades of ABB, looking carefully at the personal statement to see whether you're going to fit in well. And you know, our concern is that you end up doing a degree that you want to do and that you're going to enjoy, not that you're not capable of doing it. If you're doing the IB, then we accept um, students with 35 or 665 at HL. Um, we don't require you to have done philosophy at A level or RE, but um, it doesn't hurt you to have done those. But it's certainly not going to count against you if you haven't. It's just as fine if you've done perhaps science degree, uh, sorry, science A levels, or you've done a mix, or um, you've done, um, I don't know, uh, you know, English literature, history and physics or, or whatever, we're never going to hold that against you. We're interested really more than anything in your personal statement and why it is that you want to study with us. If you don't have any kind of um, standard qualifications, but we think that your personal statement is interesting and that you'd probably be a good match for us, uh, then we will generally invite you for an interview. And that's really just to kind of talk through your interest, what you've done in your life, and to establish um, whether were you to come to us that you wouldn't be paying out lots of money and not having a good result at the end of it. So it's not a, a threatening thing. It's really just to make sure that you're going to be OK with us. Um, and there you can see that there's a, um, some links to how to apply. And I know Kimberly is here to answer any questions um, if you've got any questions about that. So um, that's the kind of very quick and general overview of the programme. And I'm really now happy to answer um, any questions that you've got. And if you want to unmute yourselves to ask those, if you just want to type in the chat, that's absolutely fine. Um, I'm really happy to answer any questions that you've got, as I know Kimberly is as well. And I'm just going to catch up on the on the chat while we're doing this. So, yes, I think um, in the chat there was a um, few questions about alternative um, qualifications um, and our website is just being updated at the moment. Um, so we do recognise qualifications um, from around the world. And so uh, if you haven't got A-levels, but you have another qualification, you should be able to find that all on the website um, at the moment. But if you have any trouble doing that, I have put my email address um, in the chat box for you um, and you can send that over. We do have um, regional specialists. Um, in our recruitment team who will be able to um, advise you on uh, mostly every qualification um, that is out there. And if there's something that we um, haven't come across before, we're more than welcome to look into it um, and just see that it's the equivalent level to students that we have coming in or, or just make sure that we think you'd feel comfortable and prepared um, for the programmes as they are. So um, do send that over to me, but also do check our website as well. And then I can see that there was another quick question um, that said, can we come and visit the campus? So yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. We have um, two, um, we have visit uh, campus visits uh, every two weeks. Um, and then also we will have a number of events happening um, throughout the year for you to visit campus on open days, which um, this is a virtual open day, but we also have in-person open days. And that's, I think it's good to participate in both. Um, you get a different feel from either one of them, but I do think it's a good idea to come to SOAS and to see SOAS and to kind of do it when term is on um, so that you can see what it's like when students are here. It is a little bit different, obviously, at the moment um, because we are still coming a little bit out of COVID. So we have some in-person seats teaching and some online teaching, but I still think it will give you um, that experience. And I would say um, for any students who are able to visit universities around the UK, um, it is such an important factor of whether you feel like the university is going to be the right fit for you. Obviously, academic uh, wise, it's, it's kind of a priority for you. But I think when you're thinking about your studies, you also need to think, is it somewhere I'm going to be at home? Is it somewhere I'm going to thrive? Is it the right environment for me? Um, and every university is different in itself. So I think 
really being able to travel around and see different universities will help you to make sure that you're one making the right choices of who to apply to but also in your final decision of where to go yeah I think you know what you don't perhaps get from an online um presentation and so on is a sense of the kind of vibrancy of the campus the it's quite a small campus so um there's a kind of lot of hustle and bustle but that means that people really make excellent friendships there's plenty to get involved in um it also means that it's quite an informal place there's not a lot of kind of um how would i say you know formality between lecturers and, and students we really do consider ourselves to be um a, a close community and i don't think that you necessarily pick that up unless you come to the campus so you know do make sure that you book a campus visit i'm also really really happy um to meet with you um on campus i'm not going to be on campus until uh, the beginning of November, but I would be more than happy to meet with you um, and show you around as well. I also see that there's a question here about the options to study abroad while doing philosophy and a language. Um, if you do a, a joint honours degree with a language, uh, you get a year abroad uh, by default um, if you choose the four year option. And there's no extra charge for that other than that you're paying four years of fees, although Kimberly, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the year abroad is, do we pay less or not? I'm, I'm not sure about that. Yes, there is a slight difference in fees and I'll put that information um, in the uh, on a link for you and put it into the chat yeah. as well. Um, and one thing I should also say is the school as a whole is currently developing plans to enable either a semester abroad or a year abroad for all degree programs at SOAS, but that's still very much in the um, kind of discussion stage and the negotiation stage. But we think that, you know, encountering the cultures uh, that you're studying about um, is a really, really important aspect of studying at SOAS. So we, you know, we're really pushing to make sure that that's part of the opportunities that you have available to you. And I would say that even at SOAS, as a student who's coming into our programmes, uh, we are 54% international in terms of our student body. Um, and we have students joining us from all around the world. So that is, again, part of the sort of the benefit of being at SOAS. Uh, when people always tell me, OK, tell me what what's special about SOAS and tell me what makes your programs unique and I I talk through kind of the very interdisciplinary approach that we have I talk through the great academic staff that we have but I always say that one of you know the real kind of um the real kind of selling points if you will if you if it were selling uh would be our students in that they come from lots of different countries lots of different perspectives lots of different backgrounds cultures and but the one thing that they all have in common is that they want to share that and they want to learn about other people from other backgrounds and sometimes you might not all have the same opinions the same ideas but the fact is that the SOAS student wants to hear everybody else's ideas everybody else's opinions they want to know about it they want to know why it's different to what they think they want to know is should it be different to what I think and and you'll probably find when you come to SOAS that you might have some very fixed ideas um, that you have that will be wildly different to when you leave SOAS so I think that's really part and parcel of it and languages in itself as well when you're on the SOAS campus and you're walking around it's not uncommon within about a 20 minute uh, duration to have heard seven different languages uh, so I think that again is one of the beauties of SOAS. I couldn't agree more actually I think um you know, I think our secret selling point is really our students um, and how much students together contribute to the learning experience. So it's not just in the classroom. It's really those conversations that you have in the hallway, over coffee, in the quad or, or whatever, where you're really encountering all sorts of different ways of looking at the world. And, um, and you know, and I often feel as a, as a teacher, as a lecturer at SAS, that I too am constantly learning and being challenged by my students and it's just such an enormous joy to be in the classroom with so many different people and just being challenged and and you know often having a good laugh at the kinds of misunderstandings that we might have but all you know in the end 
coming together and realizing that we're um, all in it together and um, that we can really develop friendships and warmth out of those encounters. And I think, you know, in a world where your cultural difference often seems so kind of polarized, what you find at SALAS is actually really great ways of resolving some of that um, difference coming together, respecting each other, respecting our differences. Um, so yeah, I think if that's probably one of the things that makes us one of the best places certainly to work and I hope um, to study as well. Yeah, I think even in the classroom as well, you can even be coming at things from different perspectives. So because we have a very interdisciplinary approach, but we believe that all of the subjects we teach are kind of intersected and interconnected with each other. You could be in a classroom where actually you have economic students studying alongside you, you yeah. have politics students studying alongside you, you have anthropology students, and you're all approaching um, that particular module, that particular class from a different perspective. But then you're kind of learning off of each other and you realize that the world isn't built that way. We don't live in silos where we can only think from one perspective and only think with one kind of goal. Um, whatever you do will be impacted by lots of different things. And so I think that's really kind of what you gain in terms of coming to SOAS and coming to an institution that is smaller, um, that does have maybe a more specialist um, portfolio of programs, but actually it then widens your own um, kind of opinions and ideas because you can dip your toe into all of these different areas. Yeah, so true. Just see if there's any questions that we've missed. <coughs> Do you feel free to add in any questions? There's no such thing as a silly question at all. So um, do you feel free to pop in anything that you'd like there? Or if there's anything that we've touched upon um, in the earlier presentation that you might want to know, just a little bit more about, do you feel free to pop them in or pop your hands up if you'd like to as well. And also feel free to tell us just a little bit about who you are and, and why you're interested in this particular program. Um, Linda, just on alternative um, qualifications, do feel free to email me. I'll just put my email um, address there and I'll tell you whether those would work for you. I should add that we actually do attract quite a lot of mature students who, of course, often do um, have, you know, or perhaps did A levels a long time ago or who have quite a lot of life experience or employment experience. And we always consider that. And we find that our mature students not that I'm suggesting that you are, Linda, um, but that our mature students actually do very well in the program, usually uh, are at the top of the class. Just as far as which A-levels would be um, preferable, I think um, Kim has answered that um, quite well, but we certainly do, you know, have students on the programme who perhaps done a maths A-level or an economics A-level and so on. So, um, you know, as long as you meet our um, requirements, because of our approach to philosophy, we're not assuming that you've got any kind of background um, knowledge of our approach. And that's why we spend quite a lot of the first year of getting you all on the same um, page. So it's not that your A-levels don't matter per se, or what the subjects um, are. I think um, Kim is right, you know, social sciences and the humanities do kind of give you the tools for certain way of thinking and um, producing forms of coursework, those kinds of things. Um, but we're not necessarily assuming that you've done um, a lot of philosophy in the past. Any other questions?
probably quite a lot to take in, but yeah, do feel free to ask any further questions that you might have, um, or obviously follow up with any emails that you might have about the programmes. And as I say, I'm really happy to just meet with you one on one um, for the moment on Zoom, but in a couple of weeks, I'll be able to, to potentially meet in person um, on the campus. Well, if there are no other questions from there, we'll probably, um, oh, wait, I think there might have that's been. A, that's an excellent um, question. Um, no, um, it, I mean, if you do have knowledge of, of a, a language before you come to SAS to study it, all that happens is that you're given an assessment at the beginning of the year and you are placed in the, the level that is most suitable to you. But none of the first year language modules ever assume that you have had previous um, training in that, with the exception of Arabic, because Arabic is a um, has lots of different types of first year modules, and they have, for example, modules um, where perhaps you have um, you've grown up in an Arab family, even if you're living in the the UK, and so perhaps you've encountered some Arabic at home or whatever. So there'll be a particular class for you if that's your, um, you know, it's a kind of heritage class. But um, there are also, of course, Arabic um, classes that don't assume any prior knowledge whatsoever. And that is the same for all of the languages that we teach at SAS. OK. Last chance to ask any questions, and if not, we can um say a fond farewell and I hope to to hear from you my email is there uh, Kim's is there really feel free to um, email us with any additional questions that you've got or um, you know any advice in fact if you're thinking of applying and and you want to know how to craft your uh, personal statement then um, I can certainly help you with that as well Yeah, so once again, thank you all for attending today. Um, and we will be sending out a recording of this session to you in case you want to go through um, any of uh, the presentation again. Um, and there are a lot of other sessions on today as well, if you have any interest in attending those. But I would say um, I did put into the chat earlier and I'll make sure it's included in the emails that go out to you is a link to our web um, page that will tell you about all of the events throughout the year. Um, and, you know, I know some of you are listening in today and thinking about this next upcoming year or possibly um, the next year or possibly the next year from that. So um, I really would say to get involved in as many um, of the events, either online or in person, I think it just really helps you to know like I say, which universities you might be wanting to apply to, and then once you get to the point where you're making the decision, which university really fits from you. Um, I think getting involved is a very SOAS thing. Um, it's something that you'll do when you're with us um, in that you'll be a student who's obviously attending obviously your classes, but you're likely to be attending lots of open events throughout the year, which are either for your particular um, study area or just generally um, around the university. So we have lots of open lectures, um, book launches, film screenings that happen throughout the year um, that could be within your area, could be outside of that, and our students do attend. And then there's obviously lots of different student societies. Um, our students are um, activists, and so they do get involved in uh, lots of different forms of activism. So sometimes that is uh, protesting, albeit peaceful and nonviolent. Other times it could be something like um, getting involved with um, just education on different kind of topics and areas and discussions. It could be working um, in the kind of charitable areas. So I think that that's something that you'll be very used to if you end up coming to us. So why not start that now a little bit earlier on in terms of just taking advantage of all of the different sessions that we run um, online and in person. So again, I'll just thank you all for your time and for attending and thank you, Sean, so much for a great overview um, of the programs and, um, hopefully a lovely welcome to the department. Yeah, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much all for coming and thanks Kim for your support and um, hope to hear from you all before too long. Thanks a lot. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.